So, colour. What does colour do in nature? Why does it exist? Well, first of all, in nature, colour indicates function. So, for instance, if you're out foraging, you see this beautiful bunch of red rowan berries against green foliage, and you think, yeah, I recognise that, those are berries, so that's why they are red against green. Then, colour can also draw attention, and sometimes, as in the case of these lovely, cute, electric blue frog, beautiful, beautiful blue that reminds me of a David Bowie song. It draws attention indeed, but it, you may think that it's because it's cute. It's not. It's literally screaming, do not touch me, I will kill you. This is an extremely poisonous, lethal, lethal frog. Say similar kind of deep electric blue is a peacock. But he's saying the opposite thing. He's calling atten for attention, but because what he really wants is for you to love him. It's like, please, I'm here. Look how beautiful I am. Please love me. So opposite message. Then in nature, color can also provide safety. For instance, if you're a chameleon, the best thing for you is when you sit against bright green foliage is to become the same color of the foliage because that means that a possible enemy or predator will find it hard to see you unless they have a very, very keen eye. But color can also take safety away if you're the prey of a lion blending in the background, especially at dusk in the savannah when it's, well, everything is sort of this deep yellow. What happens in the built world? How, have, how do we use color? Color also indicates function for us. For instance, a red pill and a blue pill can take you to two completely different places. Then we also use color for attention as well, just like in, the, in, in nature, and for invitation. That's, for instance, this is one of the few ways in which colors is color is used globally in the same way. Uh, with traffic lights, red is for stopping, yellow is for caution, and green is for you can go now, free. Uh, we also use color for navigation. A very famous example is the map of the underground in London, where you can say I'll catch the red, red line instead of the central line. Um, so it's a very famous uh, example of use of color. Then. We can just say that color, yes, indeed, it helps us to navigate the world and also the web. But I have a question for you now. What do you think? Is color in real life the same as color on the web or is it different? Same? Hands up for same? Exactly the same? Not that many people. I've literally seen one person. So, so I think that you're all with me. When I say this thing that may sound like a platitude, that color in real life is indeed different from color on the web. But let's see how then. So in the real world, according to the dictionary, color is the appearance that something has as a result of the way it reflects light. And that's for the real world. It's a bit more complicated than that, but if we want to be Keep it really simple, that's what happens. It's reflection. On the web, color is made by light, it lives in light, and is in fact light itself. Now, this, the fact that in fact color lives in light, this happens both on the web and in real life because in real life, uh, light is reflected on the color, and on the web, it's a bit different, but both need light for sure. Now, it may seem obvious to us that color on the web is light because we are all web professionals used to working with monitors all day long. However, it wasn't always the case. The English uh, scientist Isaac Newton was the first to connect light and color in the 1660s. The way that he did that is that he was conducting experiments on something different. It wasn't about color, it was about optical science, optical experiments. So he was in a dark room and there was a stand on which was a prism, a glass pyramid basically, 
upside down, so with the, with the pointy bit uh, towards the bottom. And on one side, so it was in the center of the room, on one side of the room, there, there was a ray of light that was coming into the prism, and when it, we c it would come out, it would be fragmented into a series, a gradient of colors very similar to the rainbow. This was not something that anyone had really observed before. So these in interconnected colors ch shifted perspectives in, of meta quite a bit because suddenly, what are the things that happen? Well, first of all, there are possibly many more colors than thought before because there's no real distinction. They're not separated clearly. There's an interconnection between these colors. Then what's another thing that you notice about the rainbow? Are there any colors that are missing that we still call colors? There's no black and there is no white. So that's, sorry? Uh, brown, yeah, possibly brown is not a color that is in the rainbow. So this was quite, there, there were quite a few things that were uh, new and revolutionary. And that sort of appeared kind of by chance because this was not the reason why Newton was in, the, in this dark room. So recapping, this is what happens. There's uh, what you can see on this screen is the, a diagram describing what happened in Newton's experiment. Uh, it's a, a pyra clear pyramid with a ray of light that gets into it and comes out fragmented rather in the rainbow. So what has started as a study on optics ended up actually shifting perspectives on matter. So now color for the first time is seen as a quality that exists within light rather than being on things. So recapping, the main consequences of Newton's discovery were that light can be opened up and fragmented into colors. Then colors exist in light and not just on things. Color is a continuous gradient. Many more colors exist than previously thought. The color spectrum does not include black or white, which was quite important for art at the time. White is full presence of light, and black is full absence of light. So the main takeaway from all this is that in Newton's view, color does not exist without light. That's, that was his conclusion. Now, fast for for forward uh, sometime, nearly a century, well, no, a bit more probably. This is um, Johann Goethe, who was a, a German, uh, he was many things, he was a writer, he was an artist, but he dedicated the last few years of his life, he was born in 1749 and died in 1832, so he dedicated the last few years of his life to studying colors. And in fact, all the modern theories of colors that uh, we know about and read about on the internet and so on are very much based on Goethe's discoveries. And um, in, during Goethe's life, sort of in the second half of the 18th century, it became quite fashionable to have those prisms of light in uh, you know, salons and in high society. So he would have seen the phenomenon of the uh, refraction of light into the fragmentation into a rainbow many times. But he didn't, he didn't um, like Newton's theory so much because he thought that it was way too abstract and that it didn't actually take real life and human perception into consideration because he thought that color actually needs matter to be seen. And while color do change with shade and with the absence or presence of light, uh, they are still color and they are not the absence of it. So he, uh, for Newton, recapping, color is the essence of light. And for Goethe, color is as, as it is perceived. So what's the difference is that you, he, um, Newton's color was abstract. I mean, right there and then, it only really existed when light went through glass. Whereas Go Goethe was much more interested in color as humans perceive it and as it lives in real life. Fast forward 
from the PRISM experiment to color on the web. Now, I'm sure that you probably know already, here we have a visual representation of the RGB color system in which color is created by light. The RGB acronym stands for red, green, and blue, which are the primary colors for the RGB, RGB system that we use in all screens and monitors and so on. When these three colors, red, green, and blue, overlap, they form white. So white is the presence of um, every color, and that's why this type of color is called additive. And they are co uh, colors obtained by emitted light directly from a light source. <coughs> so white, I repeat, is the full light presence and the sum of all colors, whereas black is the absence of light and the absence of color. In real life, we use the so-called primaries model because, and the difference is that color is bounced off a surface and it's changed. It's a combination of reflection, absorption, or, and scattering of the light that hits the color. And the important thing to remember is that it's not transparent, it's reflective. So here's an example uh, of the model. You have uh, three pigments, red, blue, and yellow. This is called subtracted colors because when the colors unite, because white is no pigmentation at all, and black is the sum of all colors, or brown. When you don't mix them properly, you get brown. Now, I don't know if any, if any of you ever did any printing, but I know I, have a, I came from, from print because I'm old enough to have started with that. And I have a lot of friends who do web stuff that absolutely hate printing because they just don't understand how color behaves. But the thing is that Color in real life changes hugely depending on a number of factors. And one of them is also the support that you use, the paper. Like, for instance, the, the people who are the designers who did the uh, branding for WorkCamp Europe 2022 in Porto. I don't know if any of you were there. It was those beauty, all those really brilliant kind of tiles that were uh, pink and blue and so on. And they had such a nightmare trying to make it look the way it looked on screen. They were all saying, ah, we hate print. And I was like, no, no, I love it. It's really great. But so this is the main difference. It's reflective and the result looks different. So this is the opposite of hap what happens on the web where all colors form white and black is the absence of them. So 000, 255, 255, 255. We probably all, all know this. But the interesting thing then is that Goethe used to say, your color, your Newton's color doesn't exist. It has no real practical application in life, but now it does. We, we are using it. The Newton's color mod model is color on the web. So it didn't used to exist. Now it definitely does. Now, jump forward another couple of centuries again. This is the 12 color wheel at the basis of mo modern color theory. In this version that you see here, there's a uh, marked separation between the 12 colors. In reality, it's not quite like that. But this has the basis uh, of uncountable color harmony cheat sheets that you can find on the web, all those uh, blog posts that teach you how to use color and say, you know, could talk about color psych psychology and so on. So now this is what you're gonna learn from me today. Uh, I'll teach you how to use the color wheel, color theory and symbolism to pick the perfect colors for branding, because we were talking about that. So a first example, let's say that, for instance, a luxury brand. Uh, you're a design studio or a web company doing design stuff, and there's a luxury brand coming to you um, asking for a color palette. That happens to a lot of designers, that uh, web studios, doesn't it? Often people haven't thought about that yet. So I want to know from you, which color do you think represents luxury? Tell me one color. Gold, gold is an obvious one. This black, black can be luxury, yeah, it definitely can be used. There's another one that comes up very, very often. Yeah, purple is very much a uh, color that's used to represent uh, luxury, and that's the one I picked, so thank you. So, purple, perfect color for luxury. If you do a Google search, it's probably gonna bring up uh, purple. Uh, so here you go. Here we have it, the purple color. Now, if you look it up on the, on the internet, 
the concepts normally associated with the color purple uh, tend to be royalty, very much, nobility, luxury, power, ambition, wealth, definitely a wealthy color, extravagance, magic, very much used, the purple color, and so on. And it must be true because there's a new tube lines in London and it's all purple and it's got the Elizabeth line, like the late Queen Elizabeth. So it has to be true. But now I'd like to know, are there any Catholics in the room? Maybe not that many. I know there are, yeah, there are some Catholics. I know that. So I'm wondering whether for Catholics, the color purple perhaps has a completely different association. The color purple is also the color of the... Uh, Paraments of the church and of the priest that officiates a funeral. So to me, I am lapsed Catholic, but I was brought up as a Catholic. And to me, purple is the color of death. So I would never use it for a luxury brand because the association for me is completely different. I don't wear it. It's the color of feminism as well. And I just, I just don't ask me to wear purple. That's the thing because to me, it's... It, it sort of brings back luck and it's the color of death. So let's try something else. Um, I think a, a safe option would be a wedding. Now, if you think about a wedding, what's the color associated with a wedding? Well, that, this one's very, very easy. It's white, isn't it? We're all, this, we're in the Western world, so white is the color of weddings. And why is it? Why is it white? Because it's purity, Simplicity, cleanliness, truth, uh, honesty, uh, it's uh, light, obviously, and, and so on. So all of these qualities, so white, it fits, it suits a wedding. Unless you're Chinese, though, because white is the color of funerals in China. The, it, they, it has the same effects on uh, Chinese culture as purple has it for me as a Catholic. So... Maybe not, or maybe yes, but unless you're in China. Then another one that I really think, this one should be very, very easy. I think this one's very easy for me. Let's see what you think. Third example, a left-wing party. What's the, the logical color for a left-wing party? What? <laughs> no. Come on, what color? What's like the... Uh, the original commu Communist Party, what color was the flag? Honestly. But anyway, we'll get there. So, red. Is it going now? Red, yes. Red, because here we go, the communist, uh, Chinese Communist Party, the, the flag for China is very red. Uh, this is a hard, let's say, hardcore left-wing party. Then a sort of left-wing party is the Labour Party in the UK. So it's red. In Italy, we ha we used to have the Communist Party. It was very, very red. So to me, it's very red is the color of a left-wing party. But not, someone said blue, and in the US, it's not. The uh, red, uh, the red states are Republican Party states. They uh, the red in the US is the color of a conservative party, and blue is the color of the Democrats. Not like they're very left wing, but still definitely more left left wing than the than the Republican Party. So you remember when I said that I will teach you how to use the color wheel theory, symbolism to pick the perfect colors? I was absolutely joking. Not true at all. This is not going to happen. So, culture symbolism has really, really huge, huge limits because it's very culturally biased. As we just saw, everybody has their own associations with color. Uh, so it's very local. And plus the, the theory of color is very Western centric. You will not find anything on the internet about white meaning something in other cultures. So what we'll do instead is we'll, we'll get back to the wheel as we know it today and I show you something that is actually useful. Now. Complementary colors. This is something else that comes from Goethe. So complementary colors sit opposite to one another on the wheel. So for instance, uh, pink and magenta, and sorry, magenta and green, orange and blue, red and green. Now, color theory uh, blog posts will tell you that color, complementary color schemes are bold, your design will get noticed, they're dynamic, they're powerful, you know, all these things. 
But what they usually don't tell you is that when you put green lettering on purple, it vibrates horribly, it will clash, please do not do it. Don't do it with turquoise and that wasn't even, that looks, that looks very strange from here, but never mind. So that was uh, turquoise and orange, and uh, I've gone too far and too fast, but that's all right. And this is uh, uh, green on red, and it says, don't do this, and please do not do it. There's a number of reasons. Um, I have a conditions, condition that, um, that makes me see, have phantom vision all the time. So let's try an experiment. Stare at this, just stare at it, stare at it, stare at it, stare at it. Look there where it's white now. Look on something white. What do you see? You see it again, don't you? It's like a phantom image, but it's reversed. Of you, you, you see the same thing, don't do this, but you see it in reversed colors. This is something that Goethe noticed. The story is that he saw a woman wearing a red dress and standing against a white wall. And he looked, he was fascinated and very, very dark black hair. He was fascinated by the colors being so bright that he looked at the wall next to her and he saw the colors reversed. So uh, this phenomenon, this is an illustration fr uh, from a fantastic book called Chromorama, which um, is now in English as well. So basically, this uh, posthumous color is the name of this uh, thing. And you can see it on the color wheels that are on this slide. And basically, you see uh, the complementary color. Uh, you see the, complement the complementary shadow, the phantom vision of the color that you saw. So red, you will see red for green and so on. So in fact, uh, Goethe's revolutionary idea was that our mind can produce colors because we can interpret reality to see colors that are not actually there or that are different from what we think we see. For instance, here, oops, uh, in, in this image, there are strips of different colors and two of them have two brown squares. Which square is the darkest? There's one on the right and one on the left. When I look at it, I kind of feel that the one on the left is the darkest. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, no, they're exactly the same brown color. Exactly the same. These were experiments conducted by, uh, the it's the theory of color relativity by Joseph Albers, uh, according to which we perceive color differently depending on environment or rather factors because there are also other factors. And now we're going to play another game. What color is this dress? So uh, to me on the screen, now we have a dress that is without a doubt blue and black. That's me. Who thinks it's blue and black? Any other colors? Purple and brown. I don't know where you got that from. Anybody thinks uh, golden? White, yeah, there you go. There's always those, and it's really quite extraordinary. So long story short, this was a dress that made history on the internet. The thing is that it actually was in real life um, black and blue, but does it matter? It doesn't matter at all. What's I, what I find really interesting is that here, we're all in the same room looking at the same thing, looking at the same screen. Some of us see one thing, and some others see another thing. So we actually inhabit a subjective reality that is created by our brain. I, we have another one, we'll be quick because I really don't have that much time left, I'm sorry. So what color is this trainer? We have a trainer on the screen and I am firmly convinced that this is pink. And I know I'm right. Greenish, okay, we've got pink, we've got greenish, any other color? Gray, yeah. So I think uh, that is pink. That's it. It's absolutely pink. And then, so because everybody around me was saying it's gray, it's gray. So I went to Photoshop and I checked it and it is flipping gray. It just is. And Photoshop lies on lo lo lots of things, but not this one. This is actually a gray shoe. I see it as pink. I don't care what anybody else says. That's it. The whole point is that color is an opinion. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And that basically is why 
nobody actually cares about your brand color because they will not see it in the way that you see it at all because the way we see colors is based on an unpredictable set of variables that these, these days is made even worse because we all do different, use different devices. Even browsers render color in a different ways, way. So who cares? Nobody cares. Nobody will see it quite as you do. So tell your clients to chill, okay? It really doesn't matter. The, there is no absolute color truth. Your interpretation is as valid as mine and vice versa. So all of those of you who saw it at Gray, I was wrong, you were right, but were you? Who cares? So because I'm not gonna see it gray just because someone tells me to, I still see it as pink. So Goethe's color ideas apply to color in real life. That's exactly what he was saying. That is phenomenal. So they were both right. Both Goethe and Newton were right. So let your clients know that color can, can't be chosen on the basis of personal preference or even psychological uh, psych psychology or symbolism. It's just a bit ridiculous because it's actually an accessibility issue. And I am going to go slightly over, I really, I am sorry, I apologize, I have a little bit longer. Uh, because for instance, here's a, an image with um, signage in an airport and there's T1, T2, T3 in orange, green and red. But if you are colorblind, you see it in a completely different way and T1 and T3 look very, very similar. T2, very little contrast, that, that green should be darker. So you need another differentiation and it's good that here it's T1 and T3 because if it was only the color, which uh, sometimes it is, uh, someone with a, a difficulty in um, telling red and green apart would have a real problem. Do you remember the really bright berries that we saw earlier? Well, this is what you see if you are colorblind. Basically, the berries are the same, al almost the same color as the green leaves in the background. And even with traffic lights, uh, funny enough, it's red and yellow that look very similar. So in this case, we're aid aided by the placement because the red is on top. We, uh, everybody knows that. So in that case, it's easier. Because 80% of men and 0.5% of women suffer from a color vision def deficiency, but it's not just that, it's also the contrast issue. 2.2 billion people globally have a vision impairment. That is a lot of people. So back to the color wheel once more to learn something else that is a little bit useful. So color uh, is also called hue. Hue is just another way of saying color. And hue refers to the position on the wheel of a color. In this wheel, again, it's, this is uh, separated in 12 segments. It's not like that, really. There's, um, it's not, there is no um, tidy separation. So the, the degrees go from zero all around to 360. Hue only refers to color, referring to the position on the wheel, not taking into consideration how bright or how intense, how rich, how saturated the color is. So never rely on hue because color blindness relates to hue. That's it. So I'll give you an example of a client's uh, brand palette. That is, uh, it's uh, pink, red, yellow, blue, green, and purple. And if you're wondering why I'm always describing what's on the screen, and that's because I want someone who can actually see the slides to know what I'm talking about, even um, re whether they see it or not. So. These colors are really nice. This is what they look like when they are, uh, if you have deuteranopia, which is red and green confusion. But the problem is that the blue, for instance, is really not accessible because if I use white on it, black is even worse. But if I use white on it, uh, it's only maybe if I put it very big, will it work? How do I make it accessible? How can I use a brand color and make it accessible? Now we're seeing that blue again. Uh, in using the HSB model, which means hue, saturation, and brightness. The position on the wheel is 222. Two, two. The hue is 222. Two, two. The brightness right now is 73. But if I bring the brightness down to 39, we have technically the same hue, so the same color, but it looks completely different. different. It's now much darker. So if I put white on it, it's a safe palette. I can use it. Technically, it's the same hue. The client can't complain. So it's a simple trick, same hue, different brightness, you get accessible color. This would be, it's an example of the same hue with different brightness level. 
starting starting from 100 and going down to zero and the row below is uh, same color but with no zero saturation which makes it really great scale and this is how you can create uh, an accessible palette so this is a really good way to create uh, color pal palettes that make sense and also in the meantime i found th this uh, uh, amazing woman who's called elizabeth ali she's got a youtube channel called designer up and she has she has a color picking method that's completely based on hsb and is basically she says that you can create very very balanced palettes if you either change the hue and keep saturation and brightness the same or if the keep the hue and change those other two values. So color is an opinion, but you can absolutely make it accessible. Thank you.